black 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 ball black 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 Okay. Okay. Um, that was the weirdest intro ever. I don't know what happened, but my name is James D. Fiore, and this is Blackballed. My guest tonight is already sitting there because of the technical difficulties made it, so I couldn't introduce him properly, but his name is Richard Marsh. Richard is an ex-member of the Plymouth Brethren Christian Church. I've known him for a while now. He's also the person behind the Klondike Papers, and Richard, welcome to the show. Sorry, what, what, what did the intro look like on your end? Because on my end, it was just all sputtery. Uh, you were just sitting there looking blank, and I was sitting there looking blank. <laughs> okay, we're off to a great start. Yeah, um, got to start somewhere. So, it, it has been a crazy week. Um, the show that we had last night... Um, you know, I, I, I don't really want to um, backtrack onto that too much. There's, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on legally that I think I just want to uh, leave that show where it is. But the reason why I wanted to have you on is because uh, I wanted to talk about some of the doc, more documented and publicized stories about the church. And first of all, I want to ask you if there is any... which church did you grow up in like where where was it and what city was it in and and can you give me a little bit of rundown on um on whether or not there, that kind of thing was prevalent in the church where you were yeah uh, yeah i grew up in cambridge uk uh which was um the congregation there was a, almost exactly a hundred a hundred persons for um you know most of my time there uh the Inside the church, um, sex is a very taboo subject. Never, ever, never, ever mentioned. You know, you wouldn't even have the vocabulary to talk about it. Um, I mean, I was of a generation that went to public schools before the brethren had their own schools. So I was probably more um, better educated than the than the brethren children have been over the last 20 years where they where they never even uh, rub shoulders or interact with anyone um, outside the religion. Um, so you weren't certainly weren't conscious of anything going on. The only time that uh, anything of a sexual nature was ever discussed, and this was kind of shocking when it did happen, was at confession meetings, which was when um, persons who had been caught in some kind of sin had to publicly confess to it uh, in front of the whole congregation. Um, and, you know, because it was such a taboo subject, when it was, um, when it did come up in, in such a public setting, it was kind of hugely embarrassing and it was incredibly humiliating, of course, for the person making confession. Um, that was also the only time I ever heard a woman speaking in church. Uh, the role of a woman in the church is is just to give out a hymn, to select and give out a hymn at the beginning and at the end of the meeting. So they'll just quietly state the hymn number, like 247 verse 3, and then one of the brothers will pick up a hand microphone and repeat it. Um, so to actually hear a woman, you know, respectable older lady that I knew actually using a microphone in the meeting hall and confessing to things was a real shock to the system. Um, so, um, no, where I grew up in my childhood, I was barely aware that child sexual abuse existed. We did, strangely enough, we were allowed newspapers 
Um, and in in hindsight, that, that's a very odd. Um, Especially in the UK. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Especially in the UK. Um, they were, we, we always used to have the telegraph and then um, something happened. Who was it? One of the leaders spoke about Rupert Murdoch. They thought he was a man of sin or something. Uh, and Murdoch owned the telegraph at that time. So all the brethren switched to getting the times. It was always a conservative newspaper. And I often wondered, because the, the brethren had this blackout on nearly every form of communication, and yet the newspapers were allowed. And I, I realize now that the, the point is that the newspapers reinforced their doctrine that the world is a terribly evil and wicked place. Because if you, I mean, say you came to Earth from a different planet and you read like the Toronto newspaper, for example, you would conclude that Toronto was full of gangsters and murderers and rapists and abusers. Well, of course, in reality, Toronto is one of the nicest and safest places in the world to live. So mm -hmm. newspaper to someone who is not thinking critically, um, reading the newspaper presents the world as being full of crime and terrible, shocking things happening and earthquakes and disasters, which of course is exactly what the brethren want you to think that the world is like, because nice people aren't news, you know, nasty people are news. With the Rupert Murdoch thing, could that have been like a rivalry between the, the what is his last name, Hales? Yes, yeah, that was Hale. That was John Hale's father, the current incumbent. He, um, he decided Rupert Murdoch was the man of sin. And then Bruce Hales decided that Steve Jobs was. And the brethren all celebrated greatly when Steve Jobs died of some other unpleasant cancer. You know, oh, that's a very Christian thing to do. Yes, they spoke out about it, you know, that this was a... This was a wonderful thing, and you know, God had come in and taken away this evil, wicked man, and we were all very happy about it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you've got to have, if you haven't got real enemies, you have to invent one to hate, as you know, mm -hmm. you know, George Orwell, 1984, they had 15 minutes of hate every day. That's very deeply embedded in brethren psychology. So, let's go over some of this stuff because you you sent a bunch of material to me i looked up a bunch of stuff and yeah. and actually we, we before we get into that we talked on the phone earlier today and you were kind of of two minds it felt like one of them was that it's not necessarily like proportionally more abuse within the plymouth brethren christian church around the world than it would be in a normal say a school or whatever but and then we talked a little bit further and it is really mo mostly about using God and religion and, and your um, cult, not you, but the royal, your cult as a sort of shield protecting you from the heinous crimes that maybe some members have committed. Is that a fair assessment? Um, no, I, I think you, you kind of misunderstood me there. Um, oh. What I was trying to say is that the fact that there are members of the Brethren who are um, sex abusers doesn't in itself prove that there is a sex abuse problem in the brethren because when you've got 55,000 people a proportion of them are going to be sex abusers but and the kind of number of reported cases of sex abuse that relate to brethren is probably not uh, particularly high compared to other similar groups hmm. but um, a, a, a very dear friend of mine, Dr. Jill Mitten, did a, did a survey, I think in 2015, 2016, and she, she sent out an interview to, I think it was 250 or 350 former members of the Brethren, um, a long survey they had to complete, um, sent to ex-members all around the globe, and 27% of those survey respondents reported experiencing child sexual abuse when they were in the cult, which is a huge proportion. It's an extremely high proportion compared to the general population in those countries. And the reason that so few of these things actually hit the fan is because the brethren's, um, I was going to call it terror network, but uh, well, because basically because the brethren are so incredibly powerful and anyone and people are just simply afraid to speak out i mean if you've been abused in you know let's say you've been abused by a uh, 
clergy or member of a of a fairly regular church, and you um, and you spoke out. You, you know, a normal church is not going to be stalking you with their priests. They're not going to be stalking you with private investigators. They're not going to be hiring the most expensive lawyers they can possibly find in the country to do everything to try and um, drag you down and ridicule you. So the, the reason that, that, I mean, there's a very high incidence of child sexual abuse in the church. Um, it, it's, you know, almost 30%. And so that does feel higher then, doesn't it? Like it does feel like proportionally it's... It's way higher, but it's underreported because the barriers to reporting it hmm. are also incredibly high um, inside the church. I mean, I think you'll find that none of those cases, none of the cases that you see, uh, you know, all, all the headlines and the newspaper reports of sexual abuse in the church, none of them was reported by someone who was currently inside the church. People only ever report it after they leave. Within the church, there's a complete and absolute ban on speaking to the police or the authorities about anything of this kind. Um, now, the brethren will say, oh, no, we did send a letter around. And sure enough, after that, one of the cases we're going to look at, highly, highly public case in Sydney, Australia, that involved the Hales family, um, the, a letter was sent around to every meeting in, you know, every congregation in the world saying, if you hear anything about child sexual abuse, you must report it to the police. And but of course, everyone knows that this is just done as a, what do they call it? Yeah, it's just a like ruse. Sort of a, yeah. a ruse. Yeah, everyone knows perfectly well, you, of, course you, of course you don't do that. So it's kind of a nod and a wink. And then the brethren can say, well, look, we even sent a letter around to everyone saying this. And it's complete, it's complete bullshit because everyone knows that if you actually did that, um, then you will be hammered. So, Yeah, it's funny, though, because, I mean, the Catholics did it a totally different way. Um, it was uh, Pope Benedict, not Pope Benedict. Who, who, who do we have now? Who's the Pope now? Is it Benedict? Is that him? Uh, the, no, no. the one... Francis, Francis. Okay, so it was Pope Benedict. Car uh, he was, um, when he was a cardinal, and I wish I remembered um, the, the exact name of the document, but you guys can look it up. Um, when he was a cardinal, he was the person who authored the internal document that um, told dioceses to transfer priests and not report them to the police. Mm. It was an official Catholic policy. Mm. And then he became Pope, which mm -hmm. I, I think is hilarious. That that man should be tried and, and probably hung. But, um, yeah. you know, the, the going the other way, it just feels like, you know, uh, as a strategy for pedophiles to protect themselves, <laughs> not a very good one. Because if you're a member of the church and you're thinking of, like, escaping or reporting something and you see a letter like that, you're just like, this is bullshit. This, this is not something that my church does. So, and, and, and so I, I don't know when, what, what year was that, that that came out? Do you know, do you remember? Uh, that was, that was when the brethren lost their charitable status in the UK for a couple of years. So I think what's that 20, 2016 or no, before that. Um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's referred to, um, it's, it's the same date as the newspaper articles we're going to have a look at. Because that came out, it was so high profile that not 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 that one. The um, oh yeah, sorry, yes, that one. Yeah, yeah. the same date as that. Yeah. So this all one this, is. Uh, I was raped by out. leader of exclusive brethren. Shock testimony from a man who alleges he was abused as child by Big Jim Taylor. Rocks church's claim to charitable status. Big Jim Taylor does not sound like a man you would want to have abuse you. Not that anybody would be. A good choice, but that sounds especially awful. Um, what, can you give me a background of that case a little bit? Yeah, well, that was a that was um, that was kind of a historic case because Big Jim Taylor, James Taylor Jr., was the guy who radicalized the the church. Um, he, he basically turned it from a very stuffy conservative uh, um, Protestant sect 
into a full-blown cult in the space of about 10 years. He was a hugely, he was a very big, he was very tall and broad-shouldered and highly charismatic New Yorker um, with a, a great sense of humor, and, but very witty. Uh, and he also had a beautiful singing voice. And oh. um, he was, you know, he was a, you know, he could have gone to the top on the on the stage anywhere, but unfortunately for the rest of us, he he kind of inherited from his dad the leadership of the church, and he had that kind of magnetism that he could really influence people, um, and he could he could work a crowd, and he could whip up laughter and tears and anything to order. He was kind of that personality. Um, and even ex-brethren who, uh, you know, brethren who've left, who know what the guy did and the sex abuse he perpetrated, they sometimes you still catch them talking almost fondly of the guy. He was that kind of uh, personality. Um, he was also father-in-law of um, Bruce Hale Sr., who's the uncle of the current incumbent. And the it, it turns out that the Hales... The Hales brothers, John and Bruce, who are respectively the, the father and the uncle of the current Bruce Hales, um, had a great influence on James Taylor Jr. And it, it does seem that they were actually instrumental. They were kind of behind his radicalization of the church. Um, that's all another piece of brethren history. But, but James Taylor was, a, was an alcoholic and he would drink heavily in the meeting and he... Um, he would go on these kind of, I mean, we've got in the Brethren, you had published volumes of his letters and you could see towards the end of his life, you'd suddenly get these letters creeping in that had this really crazy tone to them. You know, all the, all the sort of punctuation and grammar went out the window and he was using bad language. And you could actually kind of, by the dates of the letters, you could see when he was having a bad spell and when he was in recovery, so to speak. Hmm. Um, but he, he, he kind of suddenly got this obsession with, I mean, he used scripture to justify it. He used a certain section of scripture that, that refers to women and women's breasts. And he, he got this obsession with it and just would, he took meeting after meeting just on the subject of breasts. And um, he would get, after the meeting, you know, and this, remember this was a few years previously, this was an incredibly stuffy, um, you know, suit and tie church. Um, he would have young women, young sisters and other people's wives come down to the front row with everyone kind of watching and he would, he would sit them on his knee and he would feel them up and down. Um, and, and, you know, he made out that this was his, you know, this was, you know, divine right. some biblical divine right to do this. And this was all, you know, God speaking to the brethren about breasts and uh, and of course, a lot of a lot of I think about eight thousand just got disgusted and left. But that still left I don't know probably forty thousand brethren left globally. And then finally, to, to cap it all, in nineteen seventy, he goes up to Aberdeen, Scotland, a whole series of published meetings on the way up, where he's getting more and more abusive and blasphemous even in the meeting, and just taking the mick and taking the mick out of people and making people stand up and humiliating them and talking about toilet rolls and just kind of complete random, random bullshit. Um, and he finally gets to Aber Aberdeen and then there was he, um, the house he stayed in, he insisted on some other brother's wife um, go to bed with him every evening. I mean, they were just in there in his room. I mean, they were kind of caught, this is the man of God, and, you know, what the fuck is going on here? And he finally, um, he kind of burst into the room, and there was the, the woman naked under the sheet, like stark naked under the sheet with all her clothes on the floor, and James Taylor sitting on the side of the bed wearing just a pyjama top, and basically uh, kind of challenged the guy as to what he thought he was doing. Um, and then everything goes haywire, the brethren kind of split and lots of brethren leave and hundreds and hundreds of families are split in half. 
Um, you know, the majority stayed loyal to James Taylor. Ne nearly all the brethren in Scotland, Aberdeen, Scotland, in, I mean, Aberdeen is in Scotland. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't, you don't know that. Nearly all the brethren in Scotland left. But around the rest of the world where they only heard kind of verbal and secondhand reports of this, there was a varying degree of splitting. Um, so, uh, yes, and, and, and not long after that, um, six months after that, um, James Taylor died, um, and the next, so, you know, that was the Brethren's flirt with polygamy, um, and the next incumbent went, slammed it back into a very, very stuffy, sort of, any mention of sex is taboo kind of thing, and it just sort of stayed locked down like that for the next 20 years. But, um, yeah, where, go on. I was just going to say the polygamy part is confusing, because it's, you know, it sounded like he just wanted to invent a new thing, you know? Well, well, yeah, I mean, it's very interesting because the Ron Hubbard who invented Scientology um, was actually, he actually lived in England at the time. And he was one of the famous meetings that James Taylor took where they kind of, James Taylor and the Hales brothers kind of elevated the idea that the leader of the Plymouth Brethren Church was a, a manifestation of God, where they kind of basically did this thing where you take the cult leader and you you deify him. I mm -hmm. mean, they basically said, look, he's just Jesus with a different haircut. That was their line. Um, at the same time as that was happening in, in Dorking, just south of London in England, Ron Hubbard was just a few miles away over the hill in some little mansion he owned inventing Scientology. And, you know, the both... The, the kind of radicalization of the Brethren Church and the invention of Scientology were all happening at the same time in the same place in the same kind of crazy 60s era where all this kind of free love and crazy ideas were all floating around. So it's like a common source of origin. Yeah, it's funny how Scientology always kind of finds its way into the cracks. Um, <clears throat> Farrakhan um, sold Scientology to his flock. You know, like he 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 started. Uh, he would give out the Dianetics book, um, yeah. starting in like the mid '90s or the late '90s. <clears throat> he was telling his flock that uh, UFOs are going to come to pick up all the Nation of Islam people and take them yeah. off to wherever yeah. the fuck they're going. You know, um, this is why these things are cults, though. Like I have, I've, yeah, I've yeah. seen people in the comments talking about like, how do people stay? Yes. Well, the yeah. answer is they don't know anything else, right? Like this no, is. Exactly. This is this is well, what makes a cult like so powerful is that this is all you know, you know. We see Ron, Ron, Ron Hubbard did it the hard way because he invented a cult from scratch. I mean, he famously said, "If you want to make a whole load of money, start a religion," and he and he did so. And he was a science fiction book writer, and he, he just wrote a, wrote his own Bible of interesting, completely fictitious bullshit and sold it to everyone. <laughs> so the Hales, uh, Big Jim Taylor, and and the Hales boys. Um, did it the easy way. They started with a ready-made congregation of, of probably around 40,000 in those days. A stuffy old church, but one with a very closed, um, separate existence that was isolated from the world. And they just converted it into a cult, which, which mm -hmm. saved all the kind of... It, it saved all the effort of actually going and rounding up people and recruiting them. They, they just took a ready-made, off-the-shelf church you know, yeah. like, like like you buy a company, like you buy a, you know, a Saskatchewan 248973 company and turn it into, you know, Teapots Unlimited. They just took the most convenient, you know, stuffy little Christian sex and turned it into a, a very a powerful and prosperous cult. And um, in the UK, and this is the part that, that I'm, that I get livid over. In the, in the UK the people in government and i guess maybe people that like own corporations ceos and people like that that do business with the brethren they must then just turn a blind eye to all this stuff in exchange for money right like they like in exchange for the the financial rewards of being involved with the brethren on a business level yeah well of course a lot of them would probably not know that they're dealing with brethren because brethren don't um when brethren in business they don't talk religion um, you could yeah. go and do business. I mean, you 
for all I know, you are doing business with brethren companies at the moment. Um, you, you wouldn't know. There used to be, it used to be very obvious that a business was a brethren business because they wouldn't have a website, kind of pre-brethren computerization days. But now there's, I mean, I could tell by one or two subtle clues if I went on the website that it was a brethren business, but you wouldn't know. How so, would you know? What are the subtle cues? Uh, oh, because if you oh, go on to their if you go onto their LinkedIn page, well, firstly, I'd probably recognise the, the surnames, the family names of some of the members as being common brethren names. Um, secondly, they tend to be um, if you go onto their LinkedIn page, they always support the RRT, which is like the so-called charity wing of the church. They've always got a little mm. puff on there supporting RRT and UBT Universal Business Team. Um, and um, yeah, it, it's just little things. And and if you look at the sort of pictures of our people, brethren guys always have this kind of very neat hair hair haircut, and they always have a, a a parting, and they've got no tattoos and no piercings, and they always sort of dress smart casual. They always wear a formal shirt, but no tie, top button undone, uh, long sleeves rolled up three times. You know, they have a kind of a dress code. And they always kind of look a bit squeaky, a bit, little bit too squeaky clean and freshly scrubbed. And they have this kind of slightly smug expression on their face. Right. Um, you said that they lost their charity status. When was that and how did they get it back? Well, it was suspended um, for a couple of years um, while they had sort of massive disputes right up in Parliament about it. Um, the only way they got it back was by signing a... Um, what was called a deed of amendment, which meant that every single Brethren meeting hall, charitable trust uh, in the UK had to produce a new um, charity deed, which states what their aims are. And in that deed, it contained a great long section saying that they would, they promised to treat former members of the church with compassion and respect and so on and so forth. Um, and so they completely, you know, was sort of, completely bald hypocrisy. They put all this boilerplate text into their um, church um, charity deeds and completely ignored it. And in fact, it was said at the time, I mean, this new text was actually read out in every meeting hall. We all had to go in there and listen to it being read out. And, and we were told afterwards that Bruce Hale said, nothing has changed. In other words, it was exactly like this letter about reporting sex abuse to the police. Uh, yeah, we have to do this to attain our charitable status. But listen, guys, absolutely nothing has changed. Don't yeah. change your practice. Yeah. And it's, you know, and then let, let's move on to another one of these stories because I found a lot of them to be crazy. So this one, um, he's like a father to me. A harrowing note written by girl 12 who was molested by an exclusive brethren leader after members, including her own mom, that's crazy, convinced her to say she had made up the rape. Exclusive Brethren is a global Christian sect with around 50,000 members. Girl 12 told her mother she was being molested by a high-ranking member and she was coerced by sect into writing a note saying that she was not abused. I mean, if that doesn't give people an idea of how entrenched people are when someone's own mom will basically, like a, a mom of a 12-year-old girl will will f help facilitate the... Um, you know, the, the getting away scot-free for raping her daughter. I have no fucking idea even what to, how to comment on that. You know, like that is that, it, 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 that mindset, it, I, can, I can sort of theorize or conceptualize what that mindset would be like until I read a story like that. And then I'm just lost. I, I don't really know even how to approach it. No, and that's absolutely true. And I think the most shocking thing ultimately and the cruelest thing ultimately about the church and the most potent illustration of the power they have over people is that they have this effortless ability to make people do the cruelest things to their own closest relatives and loved ones. Um, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll make children do incredibly cruel things to their parents. Parents do cruel things to their children. Wives do cruel things to their husbands because loyalty to the church comes first and you you're kind of taught that the more, the greater the sacrifice you make, the more blessed you are. You know, you're doing this for Jesus and it shows your loyalty that you would actually, you know, turn your child away from the door and slam the door in their face. 
um, which, uh, and this is, you know, the, the depth and the power of being indoctrinated uh, from childhood as a, as a baby and, and upwards into believing that the church has a much higher priority than any natural relationship does. Is it more likely that the mom didn't believe it, legit didn't believe her daughter, or that she said, okay, you were raped, but we still have to go with the church? Like, what's more likely in that situation? Well, I mean, if you read, scroll down the, the, the uh, article, I think you can actually see the, see the letter, the, the thing that the child wrote. And it seems like the child was taken along to the household of her abuser, abuser and the abuser's wife, um, after a very long session, coerced the child into writing this letter, and then the abuser came in on the scene as well. So they were both leaning over this kid, and she had to write the letter. What the mother's role in it was, I'm not familiar enough with the story to say, okay. except that where you come up against the leadership in a church, you're completely helpless. So I don't suppose the mother had any choice in this. Is there a commonality among ex exclusive brethren members that could ever result in a sort of movement to try to force government to strip them of their charitable status? Well, I mean, that's what happened in the UK. I mean, there was, um, I mean, ex brethren members are generally nearly, nearly all of them are not well off because when you leave the church, you you know, you basically lose your business, you lose all your money. Um, so they're not a wealthy group by any means, and the people they're up against are exceedingly wealthy. So it's a very, very unbalanced uh, battlefield. Um, but yes, in the UK, a, a handful of ex-Brethren members did succeed in, in having the charitable status revoked. I wasn't aware that it was ex-members that did that. I, 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 I sh probably didn't read the article close enough, but yeah, I wasn't sure about that. Um, let's move on again, because I want to cover a couple of other of these before we um, head on to something else. Potential witness and exclusive brethren sex abuse case paid to remain silent. What is that one? Yeah, well, I mean, the whole, the whole point about, you know, I'm trying to convey about the brethren is that, one, there is an extremely high level of child sex abuse in there, uh, and two, the reason that more of it doesn't hit the fan is is because the brethren will go to any length financial or or illegal or whatever to suppress the story and make sure it, it never comes out and usually it starts with fear um coercion um forcing people to write um affidavits against themselves so to speak even in the case of 12 year old children um and if that doesn't work um, now, this, this case in particular, this is someone who had left the sect. When someone is in the sect, they are practically, they're completely under control. They're, they're like a puppet or a robot. They can control them. Um, so, as I said, no one inside the sect has ever kind of stood up and reported child sexual abuse. It's only people who escape who actually get to do that. So, in this case, it was someone who had escaped um and because they could no longer control him by sort of fear and religion um and you know losing his family um he'd already done that uh they they bribe him instead and they offered him i don't know three quarters of a million dollars or something basically not to testify in the in this uh, child sex abuse case and then the guy actually, he signed a whole load of um, sort of non-disclosure agreements so that, you know, they would pay him the money and he had signed a way to say he would never, he would never tell that he had been paid and so on. But then the guy actually, he was a very serious diabetic and an alcoholic, as, as brethren are, tend to be. And kind of on his deathbed, he, you know, he had nothing to lose. So he leaks all these texts from, I think they were from Dean Hales, son of the high leader which showed that they were paying him to paying him not to speak to the press about this sex abuse case. It's it, the ones that I've read about and the ones that um, and, and the one that I learned about last night, it always seems like, like the victim 
Because isn't there a oh my, hierarchical uh, family structure within communities, uh, brethren communities, where certain families are up here and other families are kind, and you just kind of get lower? Is uh, it's from what I've been reading, it feels like the victims are often from these families who are lower on the totem pole, for lack of a better description, than. Like, I, I haven't read anything where it seems like a, a family uh, within the Brethren who's kind of low um, victimized a, um, f- a family member of, 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 of a family that was higher up on the hierarchy. Is that fair or is that something? Oh, that... yeah, I, I, think that's, I think that's a fair assessment. Certainly within any one um, exclusive Brethren community, there, there's this kind of cabin fever because... Um, you with you see the same people every single day at church and they're the same people that run the school they're the same people you work for in your business and they're all kind of intermarried so everyone's in everyone else's pockets and so you get um you know you get a lot of tension a lot of personal feeling you get vendettas between families that go on from generation to generation to generation because if you you know naturally as human beings there's some people we like to hang out with and some people we just find their company unpleasant and of course you as a, a free man um, to the extent that you can you hang out with nice people and if you don't like your next door neighbor if he's an obnoxious asshole then I'm not saying he is um, but you're just not going to hang out with him are you you're not going to go down to the pub with him every night well in the brethren you don't have any choice who your friends are you have to socialize with all these people and so it leads to huge social tensions and bitter feeling and that resolves itself into a kind of a chicken type pecking order in any locality there's one or two families who always provide the leaders um, and do the kind of top jobs and then there's the kind of middle class who do the dirty work and um you know the, the lesser administrative duties and then there's the guys who basically mop the floors and clean the washrooms um and in, increasingly very much now that's financially based so the rich people hold all the top jobs and the employees hold the bottom jobs and in any one locality there's always one family that is really despised and made fun of and and ridiculed it's all very disgusting but you know growing up in the brethren you don't know anything different you know i mean i could name different places around near cambridge and i could tell you which families were at the bottom of the totem pole and which ones were at the top. And that kind of doesn't change much. So yeah, yes, I was just going to ask right. you that. Is there, yeah. There's no upward mobility for the lower families, I guess. Oh, no, way. no. It all depends on your last name. I mean, and even, even marriage-wise, it would be very hard for someone from a lower caste, so to speak, to marry into the, into the elite. I mean, all of this is unofficial. No, it's all... Um, That's cultural almost, isn't it? Yes, it's cultural. Yes, it is. It is cultural. Um, and it's it's almost genetic. Um, I, I mean, there's a little bit of a, a side swipe, but I was thinking about thinking about evolution, um, and there was a very interesting experiment that was done in, in in Russia over the past 50 years or so, where they got ordinary wild foxes and bred them generation after generation and sorted out the more docile pups from the more aggressive ones. And they bred the docile ones with the docile ones and the aggressive ones with the aggressive ones and ended up with two strains of foxes, one of which was incredibly wild and vicious and one of which behaved exactly like a Labrador and would follow you round. And they they even developed sort of dog like features like floppy ears and and the way they carried their tail. Now, if you think about a closed cult like the exclusive brethren that's been going for 200 years, and, 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 you know, for most of that period, they've had the rule that you may not marry outside of the cult, outside of the sect as it was. And, and so for 200 years, you get this exodus, um, generation after generation of 10 or the, of the most intelligent and the most cynical and the most free thinking and the most rebellious 10% of the population. Uh, and what you have left to breed with is the most docile and the most gullible and the most tractable people. Hmm. Uh, I think it's reasonable to assume that the brethren are actually becoming a separate species. You know, homo sapiens gullibilitis or something, you know. <laughs> That's interesting. Um, it, it's, it's, you know, they are, 
they're genetically they're genetically selected to be easily led you know that they're, they're domesticated um to be you know told exactly what to do and not to question it i thought you were going somewhere else with that i thought what you were going to say is that say there's like eight families in a brethren community that like the 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 family with the most money on top would like you know um i almost used the word breed uh, but uh you know take on a, a, well, you know, they a breed, all right. I can right right they breed. well breed yeah. breed with like certain families and and if they go for the bottom family are they slumming it like how how does that work and is there like a lot of cousin marriages and stuff like that in the brethren well yes uh first the answer to the first one is yes you're very much elites marry elites mm -hmm. and people at the bottom are kind of paired up with other people at the bottom that no one wants um uh in terms of cousin marriage actually uh that was that was banned in the brethren in the 50s i think and it's actually super strict so you can't marry anyone who's related to you to any degree oh. and I just because of the very there was this strong tendency towards kind of near, near incest i mean they were actually interrelated um yeah. and you know either how many generations can they go on because you know soon everyone's going to be everyone's cousin they're all going to be related in a few generations i don't know what they're going to do they're going to have to bring in some breeding stock um well that just circles it, it, back to the beginning doesn't it adam and eve right like well, i don't know it, what they did with their kids but their kids i, have to I do know something. that was i, I still <laughs> wanted to ask that question in the you know in in church i never actually dared is exactly who did adam's children marry um but it's um yeah no i mean it, it is a problem i mean a lot of a lot of people in there have got very few choices of marriage partners because they're just related to everyone after so many generations of of brethrenism um yeah, yeah I, I i after the show last night um i just want to tell everyone again in case you're just joining us that uh, i'm not going to talk specifics about the show last night it's still online um, there are some legal things that I'm going to be dealing with over the, over the next week from putting that out, but I have no regrets of putting it out. Um, the, the one thing that I, um, well, the one thing, Jesus Christ, the, the many things that I took from that episode, but one in particular was the patriarchal, um, throwback kind of vibe that seemed like pioneer times from the, from the, uh, from the outfits that the women have to wear to basically what their role was. And the young lady that we had on the show last night was like, oh, if you're a woman, you cook and you clean and you take care of kids and you have babies and that's it. And I was just, you know, and I, and, and I'm always reminded that you have, I always have to go back to this idea that you, if you're born into it, then, and then that's all, you know, like, do you remember being a person where that's all you knew? And it, does it feel like a completely different person or like a metamorphosis of sorts or more of an evolution where it's like, I'm still the same guy. I'm just more wise to the game. Like, which category would you fall in? It, it's very weird. It, it's funny you ask that because when I left the church, I was so traumatized and I had very severe, severe depression issues for a couple of years. Um, and it kind of burnt everything out of me. So um, when I look back to, I know of course, I obviously still remember clearly everything that happened, you know, my life in the church, my family and children in the church, my parents, all this stuff. I remember it clearly, but it, it's, it's like you're remembering a movie you've watched. Um, hmm. It's not, it's a story that you can tell in detail and you can visualize and you know all the people, but it's as if you're talking about a film you watched, not about something that actually happened to you so yeah i do feel like a different person i feel like you know these people who think they've been reincarnated you know i can remember what it was like in a previous life when i was a a rabbit but now i'm a human being um but i definitely remember the taste of dandelions um so yeah it's weird it's um it's so everything literally everything completely changes there's no reference points around you to connect you with your previous life can i ask you and you don't have to answer this I, this is going to come out of left field so pardon me if it's if it's too uncomfortable but do you think or will you try to 
once again connect with your kids that are still in there no because uh, this is you know one of the things that's hardest for people who haven't been through this situation to understand if i tried to connect with them there's two possible things that would happen one is that they would um that they have you know drunk the kool-aid and they think i'm an incredibly wicked person and so they would kind of be horrified and they would probably be they would report it straight away to the priests and they would be coerced into writing a letter back telling me how wicked and evil i was and never to speak to them again that's probably the most likely outcome the other outcome is that they would um be um you know maybe they got to the point where they're having doubts about the church and they would be kind of interested to hear from me and they would be wondering if maybe dad was right after all um i'm in this impossible position because until you've actually come to it yourself from your own conviction that the church is wrong it still has this massive hold over your mind and then they would they would have this terrible quandary this sort of guilt quandary they would feel they should report this letter this communication to the priests and they would probably eventually break down under the sort of self-imposed guilt and bad conscience of having had this document um, if they didn't turn it over right away and, and it would basically just make their lives miserable because it would put them in this impossible position um, also of course if anyone found out that they had got a communication which and remember the, the brethren they, they monitor all their members computers and mm. commu phones and communications if someone found out that one of my children had received a message from me and they didn't report it or hadn't reported it to authorities uh to the priest then of course the my child would be in huge trouble and would be you know victimized the same way as i would so the, the only way someone escapes is if they come to it of their own conviction that this is wrong you know they have to have their personal um light bulb moment yeah uh, trying to pull someone out of the church uh before they reach that conclusion on their own is just going to cause a whole load of damage you know you could really really harm the person i i find it kind of amazing that um you you went through what you went through in the uk and then when you came here um the hunt just kind of continued <laughs> you know and in fact it intensified right yes well yes well i mean as david as david wallace said he obviously has something on them something something fierce i think david said but yeah i mean i just had i just knew too much yeah. um it was a it was a, a higher intensity than it would be for um someone who wasn't privy to so much compromising information um but yeah i mean the, the whole point of the hunt was to stop me spilling the beans and of course it sort of rather dramatically had the opposite effect but yeah they, they hunt down they, they follow lots and lots of people uh, and this is really what we're talking about that when someone has left the church they they've gone rogue they're no longer under that direct psychological manipulative control and then of course the brethren have to resort to much more um well i was going to say more unpleasant but in some ways it's not more unpleasant because there's nothing more unpleasant than being manipulated by the priests but they have to resort to different tactics to control someone who's left the church compared to the tactics they use to control someone who's still in the church and of course that's where the private investigators come in and the following people I mean, it's not just private investigators they used to follow people it's church members themselves they used to follow people and so if someone's been a victim of uh, sex abuse in the church and they leave then immediately the brethren hit all the panic buttons because okay they've got compromising information they're out in the world now how can we make sure they don't speak up how can we make sure they don't spill the beans on what's been going on in here and so the way they do that is intimidation um following people um you know brethren following people private investigators following people legal harassments um and it's usually pretty effective uh, yeah, that, yeah one of the things that um you know i mean 
they're in okay let me just they're in new zealand australia the uk canada and the united states yeah my, france germany sweden um some of the caribbean islands uh, okay. jamaica a lot in barbados argentina but the biggest congregations are the ones you name the, the biggest numbers yeah and they work as a network when they want to do something like hunt down richard marsh right so it's like all these pieces in other words what i'm saying is is that you can be from the uk you came here and they at least like there's a network where that speaks to each other in at least those countries that i mentioned right oh it's it's more than a network it's very very intensive top-down control it's the, the the horizontal links are extremely weak everything's controlled by this tiny elite at the top which is basically bruce hales three of his sons and one of his sons-in-law that's the that's the ruling clique yeah. The reason why I mentioned that, because I personally feel like they, they, if they, if they behave like that, and if they conduct themselves as that type of network, um, then they're hoisted by their own petard, and it makes me not really feel bad about saying that the cult that we're talking about has a massive sexual abuse problem, and I don't really care what country we're talking about. If they're one unit, if they're one organism, then they're going to have to take you know, responsibility for all of their members, at least as far as like the public is concerned, people like myself, who I feel that way about Catholicism, I feel that way about Scientology, I, I feel that way, you know, and I'm just realizing the second that I'm feeling that way about this particular religion as well, because, you know, they want to be held, they, they, all of them have this, that one thing in common, it's that rank hypocrisy of being able to say, oh, no, this is isolated, or no, this didn't happen. Um, but, you know, but still able to like stretch out their tentacles and do all the bad things that they do and all the cover ups that they try to make and all the hunting down of people like yourself. Um, I don't know. I don't have a problem saying that they're infested with sexual abuse, even if it's only happening in like, you know, a, a few places that we know of, um, you know, like like UK, like Canada. Well, like no, the no, United it's States. everywhere. Yeah, it's, it's everywhere. And, and it's not that the church. Um, condones or promotes it it's just that they provide the perfect growing conditions for sexual abuse to take place and 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 to be nurtured you know it, it's like a a tray of warm potting compost in the greenhouse um with tomato seeds i'm sorry i've got to call them tomatoes they're actually tomatoes um with tomato, these seeds tomato. in it okay it's not um the potting compost isn't a tomato plant but show us how it'll grow. It's just all the perfect conditions where sexual abuse can flourish, where a sexual abuser has all the access and all the protection, all the incentive he needs to take his particular perversion to the max. But it does make the leaders of the church, Mr. Hales and his kids, his fat kids, <laughs> it does make them enablers of pedophilia. So to oh, me- uh, yeah. And, and, yeah, I mean, in the cases, the, the newspaper articles, it's very clear. I mean, this, this was Dean Hales himself, you know, son of the great high man, son of the great high priest, paying um, $750,000 to this guy to cover up sex abuse. Yeah, that yeah he, this he, one he, here was from 2006. This yeah. is 2006. Brethren bid to cover up sex assaults on girls. The yeah. exclusive Brethren sect has tried for almost four years to cover up the sexual assaults of two girls, protecting the abuser, ostracizing the victims, and blaming their mother. That yeah. is a disease that is throughout the entire Brethren Church. Then, as far as I'm concerned, like it, 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 it makes me feel like they're the people at the top are just as guilty as the abuser, right? Like, like I don't. I mean, I, I, the, the, I was brought up Catholic, um, and and I knew things um, that happened to people that were close to me when I was young. It, it wasn't necessarily through the church, although there was one, um, and. I remember thinking like when, when in, in the early 90s, when a lot of this stuff started coming out, especially the stuff that happened in Ireland, you yeah. know, there was like big, big um, stories that happened in Ireland, the UK, Canada, the United States. You know, it. I was a young kid. I was like 13, 14, thinking to myself, you know, I, I can't go to church. Like I, I was viewing people that went to church after knowing this scandal as like the flock like Aunt Gladys may be nice and she might bake cookies for the bake sale on Sundays for the church, but she knows that these scandals exist and therefore she's an enabler of child pedophilia, uh, of, yeah. of, you know, and 
I, I don't the the money that protects them um, is so frustrating because it's open and shut if this was a Muslim charity. It's open and shut if this was an international chain of daycare centers. You know, mm. no one would want to put their kid there. No one would want to, um, you know, to speak or uh, to, to convert to Islam or whatever. Like it, it would be quite obvious to most rational people that the organization itself is beyond repair and it needs to be dismantled. But you add a you add a, a Christian God to the equation and all of a sudden everything goes out the window. Your good sense, your instincts to protect children, you know, your ability to ascertain what is healthy and what is destructive. And I don't have an answer for that. I don't know if it's because we live in a Christian kind of society. I, I don't really understand it. Yeah, I mean, there is a there is a, a certain uh, level of religious intolerance against non-Christian uh, denominations. Um, and the problem is that a lot of people, the brethren very, very strongly promote the idea on their own website, which is a lovely website, um, that they are a mainstream, and I, I quote it, a mainstream Christian church. That they even take umbrage and exception to be to being called a sect. I mean, a sect is hardly, a, um, you know, it doesn't have particularly negative connotations. But no, we're not a sect. We're a mainstream Christian church. I mean, no mainstream Christian church would touch these people with a insulated barge pole. I mean, they're completely wacko cult. But if you yeah. go onto their onto their website. It's all about the loving, careful, compassionate, compassionate Christians showing the love of Jesus to the poor world, you know. And it's complete. It's 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 the big lie theory. I mean, you've heard of Hitler's or Goebbels' big lie theory that if you tell a big enough lie, everyone will believe it because a small lie is credible. You know, if you say, you know, the cashier was taking five dollars out of the till occasionally, that's believable. If you say she's she's running a, a pedophile sex ring from the restaurant, that's such a big lie that um, it, it kind of well you know no one did invent something like that. It's kind of a their, their website know. is so wildly different from what the reality is that it it's easy to believe it's true because it's more likely than the reality. Yeah, even mainstream Christian. Nowadays, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how good that is. What's mainstream Christianity nowadays? Evangelicalism, you know, Catholic. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I suppose they, you know, people think of in England, Church of England, and here, you know, there's some fairly vanilla denominations that don't do anything very radical. Go yeah, Anglicans. Yeah, yeah. Go, go Anglicans. Yeah. Um, I mean, I went around a few different churches after I left the Brethren just out of curiosity, and you know they're all pretty. The ones I went to were all quite nice and harmless and decent people, and they were just totally, totally different from anything in the in the Brethren. Yes. Um, Richard Marsh, thank you for joining me. Um, we'll have you back again. Uh, this is, um, and just to let everyone know, this is, uh, I'm, I'm going to keep talking about this church. I'm going to keep on finding new documented stories to talk about. Um, I may even have a couple more people come forward uh, and appear on the podcast who have um, similar accusations as the show last night, um, as long as my lawyer lets me out of my house that day. So um, thank you very much. I'll give you a call tonight. Thanks, man. Yeah. Thanks, James. Okay. I see stuff like this and I see stuff like this and this and this and the only thing that comes to mind is how religion can potentially poison everything and uh, as tired as I am of talking about this stuff um, and I really am. I don't think I'll ever be so tired as to not want to, you know, find the fuel in my own, you know, podcast career to 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 keep on spotlighting this stuff. Um, because I watched it happen in Catholicism. I watched. I had a front row seat. Let's just put it that way. In um, the stuff, the bad stuff that can happen in uh, Catholicism, and um, 
when you have a front row seat like that, you you quickly build a, a an intolerance for for religion that uses God as both a spear and a shield so that the flock can be protected by uh, from justice, I guess I would say. Um, that was a little bit of a word salad, but um, yeah, this is a tough subject, guys. And, um, you know, I thank you for joining me. I don't even know when my next podcast is, but I'm sure it's coming up in the next couple of days. I will let you know. Big thanks to Richard Marsh. And we'll see you next time on Black Ball. Black Ball. Black, Black, Black Ball. Black, 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 Black,